Welcome to the hidden corners where truth and terror collide. Discover a realm where the lines between the living and the supernatural blur as you embark on a journey to the paranormal and visit the mysterious hidden corners of your mind. This is part 13 of the Wolfman series, the beginning of book two. Fighting the Werewolf, Mexico. Now Luther stepped out of the car with his hands in the air, a gun pointed at his head. Rebecca sat in the back seat screaming as one of the armed men yanked her out and held a gun at her head. He thrust her arm behind her and she felt the prick of a needle go into her neck. Spencer jumped out of the car and tried to fight the two men who were on the side of the car. Nikolai jammed a hypodermic needle into Spencer's thick neck. It would take several minutes for the drug to take effect, so they shot him with a taser gun, and he now lay crumpled in the back seat, crying in pain and frustration. Rebecca's hands were clasped behind her back with a tight zip tie. She was gagged, and she was thrown on top of her brother in the back seat. Gasping for breath and trying to fight off the large Russian agent who was holding her down, Luther was being led away to the waiting car with the other two agents. Within minutes, they were speeding away from the neighborhood, just as if they had never been there. Luther had no knowledge why his colleagues had not answered their phone or been there to meet him as planned. He didn't know they were already dead inside their home. One of the men in the car with Rebecca called his contacts waiting at the airport. We're going to need a couple cages, he told them. Rebecca had attempted to transform herself into a small fox-like wolf and free her hands from the restraints. But the injection of methohexatol had finally taken effect and now she lay in the back seat unconscious in a semi-transformed state of half-girl, half-wolf. They drove through the night, and Luther and the two agents in one car, Spencer, Rebecca, and two more agents in the other car. They planned to drive to the airport where they had a private plane waiting that would secretly take them all back to Russia. No security checkpoints to deal with. Luther sat quietly weighing his options. Should he tell the Russians that his formula wasn't complete? That he still needed the one missing component? The blood from Catherine Moore? Would that buy him some time? He still didn't know how he could find Catherine. He knew she was with her brother and possibly her father. He knew they were staying with a man named Miguel Flores. He had a vague idea where Miguel's ranch was located. His colleagues had given him the location. But he still had no idea how he would get to her. Maybe he wouldn't have to now. Maybe the Russians would do it for him. Maybe this would all work out after all. A Luther was a man who studied every angle. That was the reason he became a professor and a scientist. His father had been the same way. The obsession to carry on his father's work had come naturally to him. From as early as he could remember, he had been in a laboratory, watching his father with fascination. Rather than play ball with his friends, he preferred testing blood samples in the test tubes, dropping a small amount of the red liquid into a petri dish to watch it undergo various chemical reactions. His childhood curiosity grew into a lifelong obsession. He appreciated the controlled environment of the laboratory, the precision in which his experiments unfolded. He liked the smell of the alcohol and the meticulous arrangements of his instruments, the exact measurements, the detailed notebooks and the predictable outcomes that mirrored his own disciplined approach to life. He found solace in the orderliness that contrasted with the unpredictability of the outside world. Within the sterile walls of his laboratory, he felt safe. Now he was in a country he'd never been in before, and he was being held at gunpoint by Russian agents, and he didn't know what kind of torture awaited him. He knew he was taking a risk when he first contacted the Defense Department at the Russian military, but he thought he was in control, not the other way around. 
In his analytical mind, the only way to sort this out and save his life was to make them think he was still a critical component to the outcome of their mission. To bring the serum back to Russia that would transform Putin's elite military force into werewolves and create an unstoppable army. He knew that by presenting himself as indispensable to the success of the program, he could potentially secure his safety. His mind raced through scenarios, carefully calculating each move like pieces on a chessboard. He needed to manipulate their perception, make them believe that his knowledge and skills were not just valuable but irreplaceable. With the cold steel of the gun pressing against his ribs, he weighed his words carefully. He was scared, but he spoke confidently, emphasizing the intricate nature of the serum and that if they attempted to use it without his expert guidance, it, it would lead to catastrophic consequences. He explained that the reason he was in Mexico was to obtain the one component that was missing in his formula, and that now, with their help, they could assist him in obtaining just that. We are partners, he explained. I came to Mexico not to escape, but only to obtain the one element that is critical to the success of this operation. You can see that I was bringing the two test subjects to you, and you've already seen how the young one changes. Let me finish my experiment. Help me get the missing element, and then you will have all the serum you desire. Nikolai called the Minister of Defense and relayed everything that Luther had told him. The message he received in reply was a direct order. You have one week. Get it done. Jack and Miguel sat down with Julian and Juanita to formulate a plan to begin their training program. Their focus was on the unique abilities of the Jaguar combined with the endurance and the speed of the Tarahumara Indians. The training session would begin with the honing their agility and mastering the coordination of the human intellect combined with the feline instincts. That would be the key to making them successful warriors. The Tarahumara had one critical flaw. They were traditionally a peaceful people. The idea of warfare was foreign to them, but the cat's natural predatory instincts should make them into a formidable army ready to fiercely protect their territory. Jack would need to emphasize the importance of teamwork. Their ability to see well in the dark would be to their advantage, but Jack needed them to develop the pack mentality. They would need to move as one, swiftly striking and then disappearing into the shadows, as only a jaguar can. The Tarahumara men and women chosen for this elite army felt a strong passion to protect their lands and their way of life. They were fed up with the narcos stealing their land and forcing them to grow marijuana and opium. The cartels were always in war with each other and the Tarahumara were in the crossfire between the illegal logging companies and the drug cartels who wanted their land and their labor. They had become slaves to the drug lords required to supply an impossible quota of contraband at the risk of being killed. The Copper Canyon, where the Tarahumara Indians had lived for generations, was now a battlefield. Jack and his army of werewolves and mixed breed of man and jaguar intended to drive these thugs out of the mountains and canyons and take back their land. It was not Jack's fight, but Miguel was a friend, and he felt he owed him. He also felt a kinship with these people of the canyon. He didn't like what was happening to them, and in a small way, he'd hoped he'd be doing his part to fight this epidemic of drugs flowing into the United States from this region in the south. He realized that the drug trade was far larger than any one army could even think of taking on. But perhaps it was possible to at least make a difference in this valley, in this region, and even in this canyon. He didn't want to think of what consequences might come of his actions. He knew they'd be in for a big fight. The flight to Moscow was canceled. Two agents from Russia took their three prisoners to the home of one of the counterintelligence agents that was currently living in Mexico. It was a nice hacienda in the town of Monterrey, within walking distance from the Marco Plaza city center. 
It took all four men to carry Spencer into the house and deposit him into a bed. The methhexital would keep him unconscious for several more hours, but they gave him another dose for good measure and bolted the door to his room. Rebecca was carried in and put in a large dog kennel where the Rottweilers were normally kept. She was still in a state of half-transformation, and the agents didn't know if she'd awake from her drug state and return to her human form or the wild beast, and they didn't want to take any chances. Luther was given a room with no windows, and the door was bolted behind him as well. They told him they would bring him food and go ahead and get some rest. They would talk with him later. It had been a long night, and everyone needed sleep. It was harvest time, and the narcos were expecting the Indians to provide them with a large drop very soon. The drop was scheduled to occur the night of the full moon, when the golden hues of the harvest moon would be bright in the sky, lighting the road for the pickups full of armed men and illuminating the canyon walls for the runners. For the past several years, the Tarahumara had sent 20 men up the canyon trails with baskets of marijuana buds or opium poppy flowers, depending on the season, to meet the narcos. The narcos were usually independent drug runners, men who exploited and threatened the native farmers and then sold their contraband to the cartels. They lived in rural shacks in the small towns throughout the region. They drove their pickup trucks into the ground and wore fancy gold jewelry and carried even fancier guns. The narcos anticipated an easy transaction. It had always been easy. They had no reason to think it would be any different this time. They would spend the afternoon drinking beer and doing cocaine, and then by the time they were good and blitzed, they'd climb into their pickup trucks, shoot a few rounds in the air for good measure, or tear up the dirt roads to the canyon to wait at the canyon entrance where the rocks were too close together to drive their pickup trucks through. A few of them had tried breaking the mirrors off the trucks and scratching and denting the sides, but no one had been able to drive through the entrance. So they'd wait there. The Indians would bring them the baskets of the drugs. Occasionally through the years, there'd be a miscommunication on the date to meet up. And after a night of sleeping off their drink and drug-induced states, a couple of the Mexicans would hike down to the village and start shooting just to get the Indians' attention. The Tarahumara never fought back and they'd just make a promise to be at the entrance the following night with the baskets full of illegal crops. The narcos were completely unaware of the transformation that was taking place in the little village down in the canyon. Only three days had passed since the peyote ceremony where the Tarahumara Indian runners had become transformed into jaguar warriors. They would no longer be compliant farmers, easy to threaten and manipulate. They were now a formidable alliance of nature's predators, ready to protect their land and their people. Jack was proud of the teamwork they were displaying as they ran through the forest. He was at the head of the pack, flanked by Julian to his left and Juanita to his right. Behind them, the army of jaguar slash men branched out and the women brought up the rear. They were ready and anxious for nightfall. On the anticipated day of the drop, Cat was busy making handmade tortillas from corn. She had ground in the matate and cooking them on a, a large stone over an open fire. A pot of beans bubbled away in a pot sitting in the coals that she had raked aside. She was enjoying this step back in time and treating it as if it was a college class in anthropology. Cat marveled at the simplicity and artistry of this age-old method of cooking. She was anxious to get home, though, back to her canvases and her paints, she was daydreaming about returning here with her art supplies and spending an entire summer with these people. They were so different in their ways. As the noisy pickups approached the designated meeting point, expecting to see the Indians waiting with the baskets laden with the illicit drugs, they were met with an eerie silence. The damn pendejos are not here yet, one of the Mexican narcos said as he spit on the ground and popped open another beer. He pointed his gun at a nearby tree and shot it up, thinking the noise of the gun would let the Indians know that they had arrived. 
Several other men joined in the fun, and soon they were lining up spent beer cans and bottles and trying to outshoot each other, creating a noisy raucous in the night. Suddenly, they heard a howl, paused their shooting for a moment to listen. Gleaming orange eyes appeared from behind the trees and the rocks, surrounding the Mexicans, jaguars materialized in front of them. Their sleek forms blending seamlessly with the night, along with two very large wolves. The men began backing up to their trucks, firing shots at the approaching beasts. Their bullets did not touch them. The men started jumping into their pickups, starting their engines, and throwing their trucks into reverse as the jaguars moved in closer and began the chase. The next day was celebration. The first attempt had worked. They knew the guys would be back, with even more men and more guns, but the chase had felt good. And the Tarahumara had proven to themselves that they were capable of defending themselves. Julian and Juanita were willing to stay longer at the village to keep up with the training and to help guide the battles that were sure to come. The chase had united the Tarahumara with the shared sense of empowerment, but they recognized the need for ongoing preparation. The village was still vulnerable, and the battles ahead would would not just be physical, but would need strategic planning as well. Miguel, Jack, and Catherine decided to return to Miguel's ranch, take care of business there, while Julian and Juanita stayed behind. There was no cell phone reception down in the canyon, Miguel was anxious to speak with Rosa and make sure everything was okay at the ranch. They'd been gone a week, and that was the longest he'd been gone in quite some time. He didn't feel comfortable leaving his sister and Julian without a vehicle, but they'd all come in Miguel's SUV, which was now hidden from sight a mile down the road from where the pickups had gathered the previous night. The plan was to head back to the ranch, make sure Rosa and everything was fine there, And then both Jack and Miguel would drive trucks back to the canyon so they could leave one with Julian and Juanita. The trek up the hill took much longer in human form, Jack thought to himself. Running with the pack, he had easily made it up the steep canyon trail. Now he was trudging along with Miguel and Kat and realized for the first time that he was beginning to feel his age. He chuckled to himself as he realized he was just a little out of breath. Miguel's SUV was right where they'd hidden it. Jack was feeling a little bit torn about leaving the village. He knew the Mexican narcos would be back. They wouldn't back off this easy. But he had confidence that Julian and Juanita could handle the situation. Julian was fully healed and in his wolf form he was a powerful killing machine. If he had to be. Juanita had a way of turning him into a pussycat. But Jack knew firsthand how it felt to fight him when he was angry. Kat wanted to go back to the ranch and gather art supplies and fresh clothing. Jack wouldn't let her go without him. He didn't want her out of his sight. He was still feeling the effects of the vision he'd had during the peyote ceremony when he'd felt she was in danger. He wasn't sure why her life was in danger, but he had an idea. It had something to do with Professor Luther. There was something about that man that didn't sit right with Jack. When he'd met him in Germany, he was struck with how methodical and academic Luther had appeared when talking with him about the werewolf genes. At the time, Jack had thought Luther was going to help him find a cure for the disease. Luther had promised to create a tincture for Jack that would kill the beast inside of him, and Jack had needed to leave Germany before he had a chance to meet with Luther again. But since then, Luther's name had come up several times. He had a good suspicion that there was something not right about that man. And if his vision was accurate, he was one of the reasons Cat was in danger. After a long day of driving, Miguel pulled into the long circular driveway of the ranch. The guards that normally met him at the gate, they were not there and the gate was open. He had tried calling Rosa, the housekeeper and the cook who lived at the ranch, and took care of things in Miguel's absence several times. There had been no answer to which greatly concerned him. He barely had the truck in park before he was jumping out and running through the front courtyard to the front steps of the hacienda. There were no vehicles in sight, but there were none of Miguel's hired guides around either. On a normal occasion, Rosa would be greeting him on the steps with a couple of the armed guards would 
wander over from the horse barns or the pastures to greet him. It felt oddly quiet. He threw open the massive front doors at the top of the stairs and gasped. Then yelled for Jack, who was following him a few paces behind. He had told Catherine to wait in the truck, and with the windows rolled up and the doors locked, until they made sure it was safe. She watched as her brother ran up the steps, taking several at a time. There, in the entrance of the grand hallway, sat Rosa, tied to a chair and trussed up like a stuffed pig. Miguel was trying to break the ropes that tied her to the chair, and her head fell forward, dropping an apple from her mouth. It rolled across the floor, and Jack picked it up. There was a note tied to the apple, with a string. Miguel lifted Rosa's limp body from the chair and carried her to the sofa. She was still alive, but barely breathing. He checked her pupils and saw that they were very dilated. She had been drugged. Of that he was certain. He quickly called the closest hospital and let them know that he would be bringing in a woman who needed immediate assistance. Uh, ambulance service was unreliable in rural Mexico. It would be faster to drive her there by himself. Jack, meanwhile, unraveled the string that held the note to the apple that had been stuffed in Rose's mouth. It didn't appear to be written in Spanish. The letters looked to be written in German. He had no way to decipher them. He ran outside, gun drawn, to make sure Cat was still safe. Then he and Miguel made a perimeter sweep of the courtyard and the grounds immediately around the outside of the house. They found no one and no vehicles. They made their way to the horse barn where they found Miguel's hired men lying in a heap dead. Miguel reached down to check for pulses. Jack heard a noise outside and Miguel stood up quickly. It came from the back of the barn. Jack motioned with his hand for Miguel to watch the open barn door at the front while he quietly ran to the back of the barn toward the noise. One of the stalled horses whinnied and stomped her feet. A movement caught Jack's eye, and he darted behind an open stall door just as a shot rang out. Miguel ran for cover, and another shot ricocheted off the beam of the wooden horse stall door right near Jack's head. He fired a shot in the direction of the sound, and he heard the bullet strike wood. Miguel looked in Jack's direction just as a bullet came through the front open door of the barn and barely missed his head. Reacting swiftly, he opened fire, engaging in a fierce exchange of shots. Jack felt the rage inside him and knew he was beginning the process of transformation. There was no time to undress. The buttons on his shirt were popping and he kicked off his boots and tore off his clothing as quickly as he could, but his sharp hearing picked up the almost silent footsteps coming towards him. Just as he reared his head back and felt the cracking of his bones in the final throes of transformation, the Russian came into full view with gun raised and fired. Jack felt the bullet graze him as he leapt through the air, catching the man full on the chest and knocking him onto his back. He ripped into the man's neck with his teeth and tore open his throat. Then he ran through the barn to Miguel, who was still standing behind the barn door, firing at the other agents. Miguel used his hand to quickly point out the direction of the two men, one behind the tractor parked by the fence, one to the right, just around the corner of the barn. Jack bolted out the door, dodging bullets as his sleek wolf body ran toward the tractor. The frightened Russian agent, surprised at the attack by the wolf, tried to run. Miguel fired and he fell. The agent to the side of the barn fired more shots toward the wolf. Miguel ran to the back of the barn and out the rear exit door to take the man from behind. With Miguel behind him and Jack in front, the Russian had nowhere to run. He attempted a couple more shots, but Miguel struck him in the arm with a bullet. He dropped his gun and he surrendered. Jack ran to the truck to find Catherine. She was gone.